Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Home to one of North America's most violent mafia families. Defeated like somebody, but there was no nonsense. Dead. During the 1980s and 90s, a vicious mob war spills onto the city streets. And a new generation of mobsters shoots their way straight into the limelight. They were media dogs. They liked the attention. What's the point of being a gangster if nobody knows who you are? Philadelphia watches the bloody spectacle play nightly on TV. Police are calling it a mob assassination. Behind the gunfire, a bitter contest between greed and tradition that tears the Philadelphia underworld apart. Angelo Bruno, godfather of the Philadelphia Mafia for 21 years, is one of North America's most powerful organized crime bosses. To the authorities, he portrays himself as a quiet tobacco salesman. But in reality, he makes millions from illicit gambling rackets, collecting illegal taxes from local businesses and loan sharking. Former Philadelphia mobster Nick the Crow Caramondi killed for the Philly mob and grew up in the city under Bruno's rule. He became the boss in 1959, and uh, he ruled it with an iron hand. Uh, he kept it pretty quiet, and not too many murders, uh, a murder occasionally here and there. Bruno's lawyer and friend, Nick Nastasi, remembers Angelo's quiet authority. Uh, I once walked with him in his neighborhood. And there wasn't this ostentatious show of, I'm a tough guy, I'm a wise guy. It just wasn't uh, a part of his character. March 21st, 1980, a stormy evening in South Philadelphia. Angela Bruno pulls up outside his house. At the wheel is his trusted driver, John Stanfa a Sicilian-born mafia associate. Bruno lives in the heart of the city's Italian-American community. Here, he feels safe. As a mafia dawn, he rules these streets, but not for long. The shooting was gangland style. Angelo Bruno was shot in the back of the head at Point Blank Range. FBI agent Jim Marr is called in to investigate the crime scene. Bruno was still seated in the passenger side of the car, his mouth open, his head back. From looking at the body uh, first, it appeared as though he'd been shot behind the right ear. Bruno's death sent shockwaves through Philadelphia's close-knit Italian community. Many in South Philly respected him. They called him the gentle dog because of his preference for conciliation over violence. Perfect gentleman, perfect neighbor. Always had a hello, always spoke kind. He was uh, such a well-liked man that uh, didn't realize that something like this could happen. Bruno's murder causes panic inside the closed world of the Philadelphia Mafia. Angelo gets killed, and everybody's running in different directions, trying to figure out who did it. Everybody was scared to death. Bruno grew up here, in the Italian market district. The people looked up to him. He'd come a long way, from the son of a grocer to a millionaire. His parents were Sicilians, part of a wave of immigration during the 1900s. Many made their home in South Philadelphia, just a mile from Independence Hall, the birthplace of the US Constitution. But the early Italian immigrants soon encountered barriers of wealth and class that excluded them from the elitist social circles of Philadelphia. So they closed ranks and built their own fortunes. At the heart of it all, the Italian market that still operates today. 
It was here that the early Italian gangs began to operate in the fragile immigrant community. They made good money running protection rackets from other rival gangs. The Sicilians emerged as the most powerful. The Philadelphia Mafia was born. Journalist and Philly mob expert, George Anastasia, descended from Sicilian immigrants himself, grew up in South Philadelphia. They come to this country as immigrants, they're Italians. At that point, a lot of doors are closed. They make the choice to become gangsters. It's the wrong choice, but they make that choice, and they re rise to the top of their field. It was in this world that Angelo Bruno operated, and soon he proved he had the ability to rise to the top. I've since represented hundreds and hundreds of people in leadership positions, and I will tell you that Angelo Bruno was as bright and inquisitive a mind as the most inquisitive minds that I've represented. Bruno, seen here in this FBI surveillance film, ran his organization the Sicilian way. Honor, loyalty, and obedience were the pillars on which the Philly mob stood. Its members bound by sacred oaths and secret rituals. Chief among them, Omerta, the vow of silence. Induction into the family was reserved for those who killed for the organization and was marked by solemn ritual. The hand is cut and religious symbols are burned to signify the sacred blood ties of the mafia and its members. For Philadelphia mobster Nick Caramondi, it was a major honor. It's like you died and went to heaven. I mean, you're somebody now, you know. It's, it's, it's not something that you could join. You have to be chosen. Uh, if I betray any of these people here, I should die like the saints in hell. True to Mafia traditions, Angelo Bruno's crew lived and died by this strict code of silence. You didn't rat on your brothers, and you didn't brag about what you were doing. Angelo Bruno was very much an, an old world kind of Mafia boss, maybe the last one in Philadelphia. And the idea was you make money, you don't make headlines, you don't call attention to yourself. Bruno had strong ties with New York boss of bosses, Carlo Gambino. Together, they sat on the commission, a board of the most powerful mob bosses in the US. Bruno allows the Gambinos to operate drug deals on his territory for a percentage of the profits, but he bans his own Philadelphia crew from participating in the lucrative narcotics trade. This riles many of Bruno's underlings. Frustrated, they start to resent his financial success. Bruno miscalculates the rising levels of discontent. It led to Angelo Bruno's downfall because some of his members felt he was grabbing all the money for himself, holding it, and they couldn't do anything. Among the dissenting factions is Bruno's ambitious consigliere, or chief advisor, Tony Bananas Caponegro. Soon after Bruno's death, Caponegro is summoned to New York by the commission. Nick Caramondi speaks to him before he leaves Philadelphia. I'm in this bar that I met Tony, and uh, he says, I'm going to New York tomorrow, and everything will be OK. When I come back, everything is going to be different. But Caponegro doesn't return. He disappears. A month later, Bronx, New York, 100 miles north of Philadelphia. The police investigate an abandoned car. A grisly trail of dollar bills leads to the trunk. Inside is a battered body. The dollar bills indicate the victim's transgression. Greed. It's Capa Negro. He was so badly beaten and uh, unrecognizable that um, it took a month for the New York Police Department to identify the body. Rumors spread. They revealed that Caponegro murdered Angelo Bruno so he could take the position of Philadelphia Godfather. The commission, infuriated that Caponegro killed Bruno without the consent, sentenced the consigliere to death for committing the ultimate violation against a mafia family. An unsanctioned hit. It was economics. Bruno's killed, Caponegro's killed, and the Philadelphia family is kind of turned into a chaotic condition from which it never really recovered. It just was careening out of control ever since then. With Angelo Bruno and Anthony Caponegro dead, 
The Philadelphia Mafia needs a new dawn. Phil Testa, Sicilian-born mafiosi, was Angelo Bruno's underboss, which makes him the natural choice for successor. With the approval of the New York crime families, Testa steps into Angelo Bruno's shoes, but they prove impossible to fill. What he did was try to keep the Bruno reign and that style going, but it was, it was unable to do that because there was too much at stake. Violence had been let loose, and people realized that they could advance by, by murder. March 15, 1981, almost a year to the day since the murder of Angelo Bruno, mob boss Phil Tester returns to his home in South Philadelphia. Police are calling it a mob assassination. Testa is fatally wounded by a remote-controlled nail bomb placed under the front stoop. How loud was the explosion? Loud, loud enough to blow me right out of my bed. I said, it must be a bomb or something, you know, the way it went off. It was very powerful. It was uh, the contents of 13 sticks of dynamite in a box with finishing nails. It was designed to act like a Claymore mine and scatter all this shrapnel. It blew most of the wall out into the street in front of the house. Uh, with some of the debris uh, hitting his car, which was double parked. The perpetrators of the bombing are never brought to justice. Although many believe the incident was ordered by Testa's ambitious underboss, Peter Casella. Philadelphia has lost two godfathers in less than a year. It's unprecedented. Once again, the New York crime families must decide who will become Philadelphia's next dawn. It's a decision that started the bloodiest chapter in Philadelphia's violent mob history. 1981. The Philadelphia Mafia is in turmoil after the murder of two mob bosses, Angelo Bruno and Phil Testa, in less than a year. The door is wide open for a new godfather, and the man to step through it is little Nicky Scarfo, Testa's consigliere. One little thing, I mean, Scarfo could turn on you in a minute. Uh, I mean, we were all were afraid, you know, we we followed the rules. As long as you followed the rules, you were okay. But if he didn't like somebody, that was it. There was no nonsense. Dead. What Scarfo lacks in height, he makes up for in violence. Within the first year of his reign, nine people are murdered. Two in retaliation for Phil Testa's death. The Scarfo murder was a calling card. If, if you annoyed him, aggravated him, you're likely to get popped. And that destabilized the whole organization. There was no regard to honor except for his. Everything centered around him. He was a totally self-centered, egotistical maniac. Salvi Testa is the late Phil Testa's son and one of Scarfo's captains. Fellow mobsters see him as a future high flyer. Salvi has killed over 10 men for Scarfo, and the mob boss holds him in high esteem. Salvi plans to marry the daughter of Scarfo's underboss. The new Don gives the couple his blessing and plans an extravagant wedding. The wedding was already set up. They were going to have Michael Jackson come and sing at this hotel, 700 guests. But Salvi gets cold feet and calls the wedding off. Nicky Scarfo is furious. Salvi Testa had embarrassed my underboss. He embarrassed me. You can't have that. What kind of respect is that? But the real reason was that Scarfo was worried that Salvi Testa was gaining too much of a following within the organization, very charismatic, a young kid, and he was worried about him as a rival. Scarfo wants Salvi dead. He orders Nick the Crow Caramondi to make the hit. I got nightmares over him because he was a true, true mafioso. I mean, they didn't come any better than him. And I really didn't want to see him go, but, uh, you know, that's the way it was. Out of loyalty to his blood oath, Caramondi follows orders. But Salvi Tester is no easy target. He's understandably nervous. When he used to come around, he used to shake my hand and, I sort of fail me down to see if I had a piece. He'd hug me, and then with his hand, fail me right down to the waist. 
After months of waiting for a good place and time, Caramondi and his trigger man seized the opportunity in the back room of a candy store on the Italian market. As soon as he turns his back, he gets up and shoots him back of the head. Then when he goes down, he gave him another one. Bang, bang. Two bullets to the back of the head, and Salvi Testa is dead. His body is dumped by the side of a country road in New Jersey. A growing media frenzy catapults the citizens of Philadelphia into the violent world of the once low-lying mafia. This is real-life drama, and the set is right on the public's doorstep. It is very much a soap opera in Philadelphia. It always has been. And if they weren't shooting each other, it would almost be a black comedy. But these guys all got guns, and they're all knocking each other off. By the 1980s, FBI surveillance technology has become far more sophisticated, allowing them to watch the Mafia's every move. 1986, the Delaware River that borders Philadelphia. A development company, Rouse, plans to build a multi-million dollar housing scheme on the waterfront. It's the backbone of an extensive urban redevelopment project to help bring Philadelphia out of the economic doldrums. High unemployment has left many downtown areas crime-ridden. Philadelphia wants to attract new investments, but this redevelopment attracts attention of a far more troubling kind. Mafia. Nicky Scarfo decides he can make millions of dollars in a vast extortion scam from the Rouse development project. He sends Caramondi to shake down the owner, William Rouse. If the development company cooperates, the mob will leave them alone. I met with the guy, and I said, look, it's this, one million, and you could have whatever you want. You could have the whole waterfront. Then you won't have any trouble with the uh, unions. We'll get you the contractors. You won't have no labor problems. This is what you're getting for a million dollars. But William Rouse is outraged. He refuses to be intimidated. Instead, he seeks help from the Mafia's biggest enemy. It was such a bold and blatant uh, shakedown that it drove Rouse uh, right to the FBI. It's the break the FBI has been waiting for. When Caramondi returns with his crew for an answer, he doesn't realize that one of the developers is a wired undercover FBI agent recording his every word. All right, now, let them show you and tell them... We were able to introduce an undercover FBI agent as the Rouse executive, and they went forward and tried to shake him down, the FBI agent, for the million dollars. It's all over for Caramondi. He's sent to jail to await trial. But Don is infuriated. Caramondi's capture would implicate Scarfo directly in the crime, and the penalties will be heavy. I was sick laying in my cell. What am I going to do? I'm in trouble. I'm in serious trouble. Caramondi translated trouble to death, that he was to be the scapegoat that in the Rouse extortion, removing him, taking him out, uh, maybe lessens the, the problem. Faced with prison time or death at the hand of Scarfo, Caramondi is forced to make the toughest decision of his life. It took me two days, and I finally called the FBI, and uh, I only wanted to talk about certain things. I didn't want to talk about it. I just wanted to talk about my own self. I didn't want to involve other people. When he received the idea that he was going to be the sacrificial lamb, he decided that uh, he, his future lay with the federal government rather than with the mob. It's a turning point for the Philly mob. Nicky the Crow Calamandi sings. He becomes a key witness and betrays the Mafia's oath of Amerta. His deal was that he would plead guilty to the extortion and take whatever sentence the judge gave him. And that we would make, we would make no recommendation as to sentence, but would tell the judge 
about the value and extent of his cooperation. But if the judge gave him 20 years, it was 20 years. With the star witness ready to testify, the FBI arrests Scarfo. In court, Caramondi testifies against his former boss. He was 10 feet away from me, looked me straight in the eyes, or looked him straight in the eyes. For the next eight weeks, it's a war of nerves as Caramondi's colleagues make their bitter feelings known. To be 19, 20 lined at the table looking at me, you know. And people in the audience making faces, you know, like uh, this, <laughs> this. <laughs> they used to go like this. So it was pretty scary. On November 19th, 1988, Scarfo is finally found guilty, along with 16 others, on multiple charges, including murder, extortion, and drug dealing. It's all over for the Philly mob boss. He's sentenced to life in prison, scheduled for release in 2033, at the age of 104. Scarfo in jail creates a dangerous power vacuum in the Philadelphia mob. But waiting in the wings is a young wise guy with big aspirations. If little Nicky Scarfo was an unstable Don, then Joey Merlino's love for the media spotlight will bring down the heat in a different way. By the late 1980s, South Philadelphia is in the grip of a brutal mafia war. Well, I'm concerned about the community and the neighborhood uh, in, in South Philadelphia. Uh, we have to do something to uh, 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 not permit this type of lawlessness. In the chaos following the jailing of Godfather Nicky Scarfo, a fresh group of wise guys take center stage. This rare footage reveals the new big hitters of the Philly mob. At their head is a young hotshot with big ambitions, 35-year-old skinny Joey Merlino. He captains a softball team supported by a local South Philly restaurant. Mobsters at play, something that neither the FBI nor Philadelphia has seen before. And Skinny Joey loves every minute of the attention. We were looking at a change in the membership of La Cosa Nostra. A younger person, a less dedicated to the mores of the mob, the legend of the mob, the discipline of the mob. The newer generation was not satisfied with the old ways of holding power quietly and just being. They wanted to be recognized. With Scarfo in jail, Merlino wants to take the top spot for himself. And there's only one way to get it. He moves in on Scarfo's old territory, South Philly. Bookmakers, drug dealers, loan sharks, and even shopkeepers pay Merlino protection money or risk intimidation and violence. The cash goes tax-free straight into his pocket. But when Skinny Joey runs into Scarfo's son, Nicky Jr., also collecting street tax, there's trouble in store. Merlino becomes defiant. October 31st, 1989, Halloween night. Dante and Luigi's restaurant a traditional haunt for generations of Italian-Americans in South Philadelphia. Nicky Scarfo Jr., the imprisoned Don's son, dives into his favorite meal of clams and spaghetti. He never sees the masked man walking through the restaurant towards him. It was clear that the attackers meant to kill the young man. Even though Nicky Scarfo Jr. is hit eight times at close range, the bullets miss vital organs, and miraculously, he survives. The mob hit in the middle of a public restaurant shocks the city. Merlino's street crews are getting out of hand. The Philly Mafia needs a new dawn to stop the public violence, and fast. Once more, the New York crime families must approve a new godfather for the Philadelphia mob. This time, they play it safe. They bring in John Stanza, a Sicilian steeped in the old ways of the Mafia. Stanza was the personal driver for the gentle Don, Angela Bruno, and is trusted by the New York Commission. 
The New York families go to Stanford and say, Stanford, go back to Philadelphia, put that family back together. But Stanford immediately locks horns with the ambitious Merlino crew. Right away, he's in conflict with the younger guys, and they're saying, who's this interloper? Who's the Sigi? He calls them the little Americans. They call him the greaser. It's, it's a generational thing. It's an ethnic thing. Uh, and this, you know, this tension develops. The once protective bubble of the Philadelphia mob has burst. This new generation of mobsters doesn't feel connected to the secretive world of the Sicilian Mafia and believes John Stanford has no right to run an American Mafia family. You have changes taking place then in American society where subsequent generations are totally assimilated. They are no longer bilingual. They no longer have the older European set of values and cultural influences. They're just totally American. In 1990, Joey Merlino's criminal career is interrupted. He's sent to jail for four years on charges of armed robbery. Inside, Merlino's dislike for John Stanford plays right into the hands of Ralph Natale, a mafia old-timer imprisoned on narcotics charges. Natale encourages the ambitious Merlino to wrestle control of the Philly mob from John Stanford and take it for the both of them. Joe is talking about John Stanford and the turmoil in Philadelphia. And Ralph, considering himself an old head, starts to advise Joe, telling him what, what to do, how to act, that kind of stuff. With Merlino in prison, it's time for Stanford to bolster his own crew. His attention turns to Big Ron Previty, a former Philadelphia cop gone bad. Previty is an established thief. He made his name in the underworld, fleecing the casinos in Atlantic City. The mob allowed him to operate as long as he paid them a street tax. There was a hundred different ways to steal from the casino. Uh, you steal from the casino, you steal from patrons, you steal from rooms, you steal everything. And uh, the amount of money I made was astronomical. Privity has the know-how to earn good money. And Stanford wants a piece of the action. He recruits Previty as a bodyguard and allows Big Ron to operate his criminal activities in Philadelphia. In return, Previty pays Stanford a cut of his proceeds. I was useful to the Philadelphia Mafia because I brought in scads of money. A lot of money through my bookmaking, through my extortions. I was constantly bringing Stanford money, constantly. Previty is a practiced extortionist. His disturbing methods revealed why Stanford values him. You, you don't want to kill people for, the, for money when they owe you money, because if they're dead, they can't pay you. So you beat them up, you threaten them. You'd hit them with a baseball bat. I had a guy one time, I, I took him to a car, opened a hood, and put his head next to the fan belt and closed the, uh, the hood on his head. And, you know, every time the fan went around, it would hit his cheek. You don't have to do it often because when Joe Blow tells Bob Blow that you stabbed him with a screwdriver and shows him, you know, they pay you. But secretly, Brevity is worried. Skinny Joey is on early release from prison, and the Merlino Stanford power struggle is spiraling out of control. The violent nature of the rival factions could mean trouble for Brevity. The generations have totally changed that, you know? It's a whole different thing nowadays. They're more like street corner thugs than a uh, organized crime unit. With Previty in the middle of this turmoil, the FBI spots an opportunity. They know he's in a vulnerable position, and they want to exploit it. The FBI makes him an offer too good to refuse. A weekly payment in return for mob information. Working for the FBI at the time, working for Stanford at the time, working for myself at the time. I mean, bullets were flying, people were getting shot. Uh, I got Stanford screaming and hollering, he wants money. I got the FBI wanting information. It's a, it's a tightrope, it's a real tightrope. But uh, hey, I walked it. With Stanford oblivious to an informer in his midst, he makes a calculated move that surprises many. He tries to bridge the generation gap between him and the rival Merlino factions and bring stability to the Philadelphia streets. 
Stanford makes Joey Chang Changolini his underboss. Joey's brother Michael is a member of the rival Merlino gang. Merlino soon responds to the conciliatory overture. March 2nd, 1993. The Warfield Cafe just off Schoolkill Expressway in South Philadelphia. Before dawn, it's a desolate spot. The cafe is a mafia front. The owner is Joey Chang Changolini, Stanford's newly appointed underboss. The FBI constantly monitors the restaurant with surveillance cameras pointed at the front door. 5.54 a.m., Joey Chang and a waitress arrive for work. Less than four minutes later, a station wagon with mafia rival Joey Merlino and his crew drive past the restaurant. You can see the car go by the first time, then you can see the car go by and pull in. You see the three figures come out of the car and go into the luncheonette. Inside, FBI wiretaps pick up the next five seconds of audio as gunfire rings out. You hear the gunfire from the microphone inside. You hear the waitress scream, and you see them leave. It's the only recorded mob hit in history. Joey Chang takes five bullets, but somehow survives. Among the assassins, Joey Chang's brother and Merlino crew member, Michael Changolini. Stanford takes the news seriously. This time, he decides on a violent solution and orders a revengeful hit on Merlino and Changolini. Philadelphia is playing center stage to a violent mob war. Godfather John Stanford has ordered the murder of Joey Merlino and Michael Cangolini, members of a rival mafia crew. Stanford's chance comes on August 5th, 1993. Catherine and 6th Street, a residential area in South Philadelphia. Bullets and bloodstains on a South Philadelphia street mark the spot where Michael Cianglini was gunned down August 5th. A second mob figure, Joey Merlino, leader of a dissident mob faction, was seriously wounded in the attack. Merlino takes a bullet in his back, but barely a dent to his ego. A few days later, he's back on his feet attending the funeral of Michael Cianglini. Merlino was infuriated with Stanford. It's his turn to move in for the kill. Morning rush hour, August 31st, 1993. Philadelphia Schoolkill Expressway, an eight-lane highway that brings thousands of commuters into the city every day. Philly mob boss John Stanfa and his son Joey are headed downtown on business. Their car is driven by ex-US Marine bodyguard Freddie Aldridge, who's wary from all the recent mob violence. I'm looking out the front window. 50% of the time, I'm looking in a rear view mirror 50% of the time, usually for a tail. And I, I, I saw this van creeping up on my right quarter. I felt uneasy about it. I said, this doesn't look right. Suddenly, the van closes in. Automatic gunfire rakes Stanford's car, and all hell breaks loose. The guns are blazing. I can see that the bullets are ricocheting. They're going in the car. I said, it's a hit. We're being hit. Aldridge takes drastic action and forces the assailants off the road. The back tire of his vehicle blows out. The bullets miss Stanfa, but his son isn't so lucky. John got up from the position that I put, pushed him down on and saw that Joey was hit in the face. And he said, stop the car, stop the car. I said, John, there's nobody going to help us here. And he said, OK, Freddie, drive. Drive the best you can. Aldrich heads for Stanford's headquarters, an old warehouse just off the expressway. From there, they swap cars and drive to the hospital. Joey Stanford has been hit in the jaw. It's a terrible wound, but he'll live. News of the Stanford hit spreads. People are astonished to see the mob war now spilling out onto the commuter belt. 
Gunman recently tried to kill this man by machine gunning his car on a city freeway during the morning rush hour. It's that disregard for innocent bystanders that has Philadelphia so concerned. That kind of hit was unheard of in Philadelphia. If you look at the way the Molino faction operated, they were basically saying to John Stanford, you think you're tough? We're, we're tougher. But in 1994, law enforcement gathers enough evidence to intervene. Philadelphia mob boss John Stanford is arrested on racketeering and narcotics charges. The judge gives him five consecutive life sentences. Among the key informants, one of Stanford's own, Ron Previty. He shouldn't have trusted me because in the old Sicilian rules, an ex-cop can't be a gangster. I think John Stanford was an old-time tough guy. Uh, he believed in the Mafia. He really believed it. He believed in the old ways, but there is no more old ways. It's so watered down no more that that's history. In the same year that Stanford is sent to jail, Ralph Natale is released. Natale joins forces with his protege and Stanford rival, Joey Merlino. Natale and Merlino appoint themselves as boss and underboss. This time, the New York families don't get involved. They have enough problems facing an FBI crackdown on their home turf. Natalia and Merlino are on their own. Their relationship is growing increasingly strained. I don't think that Merlino and Natalie ever got to the point where they exercised real power because their organization was so dysfunctional. But in the public eye, the Philly mob has never been more visible. During the mid-1990s, Merlino actively seeks publicity and promotes himself as a flamboyant godfather. Well, yeah, he was a GQ gangster. He liked to dress nice. He liked women. He liked flashy cars. He was a flashy guy. He needed a lot of money to live the life he did. Uh, he was a funny guy, but Joey was a stone-cold killer also. They were media darlings. They liked the attention. What's the point of being a gangster if nobody knows who you are? It's the total antithesis of Bruno. Molino regularly holds neighborhood charity parties. He courts the journalists who cover the events. And it's Joey Molino, the celebrity gangster. Joey Molino with the Christmas parties for the homeless. We help create this, this image of Joey as this Robin Hood. With the media's help, Merlino positions himself as a model citizen, not as a federal criminal. He'd go to a Catholic school, and the little Catholic school children would come up to him and say, Mr. Merlino, you are my idol. My pleasure. Happy holidays. You're my idol. And I'm a Catholic. And I just found it really offensive to have some little Catholic kid go up and say, you are my idol. I mean, he's, he shouldn't be anybody's idol. You wanna lock me up for this? It's not a crime, right? <laughs> but the FBI has an ace up its sleeve. Use informant Big Ron Previty to put both Merlino and Natalie away. But there's a problem. Previty is known to be a friend of rival John Stanford. Previty, with the help of the FBI, tries to ingratiate himself into the rival faction. We had to position Previty with Natale and uh, Merlino so that they wouldn't kill him uh, and that he could begin to report to us on them. Word is out that Previty is the moneymaker in the underworld. Natale arranges to meet him. Ralph shook my hand, and he said, I'd like you to be my guy in the South Jersey area. And he was supposed to be a real smart guy, and he probably was, but he was dumb when he called me. Previty managed to get close to Natalia and Merlino, but now the feds want Big Ron to do more than pass on information. They want him to wear a wire to secretly record his mafia associates and their criminal activities. And the FBI is ready to pay even more for the privilege. The FBI pandered to my weakness, which was money. 
and they threw a lot of money at me. And I took it. I was making, jeez, I mean 9000 a month plus expenses. Although Previty cuts one of the best financial deals in the history of the FBI, he places himself in a very dangerous position. If they discover the wire, what do you do then? I mean, the only thing you can do is kill the guy. Well, oftentimes he was in places where we we didn't, you know, we didn't we couldn't see him. He was in a building we didn't know where he was in the building. If they decided to kill him, we would just know who we who had killed him when, if we got the tape back. Previty risks discovery on a daily basis. You know, I was in a room one time recording some people, and I I put my leg up on the table, and the button, and the on-off button was hanging out under the pant leg. Right? I'm looking around. I said, "Oh shit!" And these dopes didn't even see it. So I just put my leg down. I said, "I gotta go, guys," and I left. Finally, Previty records a series of incriminating conversations for the FBI. The evidence is so powerful, it could be the final blow to the Philadelphia mob. Philadelphia, 1999. Ralph Natale has spent five years at the helm of the Philly mob. After two decades of bitter rivalry, he's struggling to keep the trigger-happy factions under control. Natale's underboss, skinny Joey Marlino, appears to be the one in charge. The relationship was that Ralph was going to be the boss and Joey the underboss, but in reality it never was. Joey was always the boss. To make matters worse, the FBI surveillance teams follow Natalia Merlino's every move, building a case against them. This is the Fed's most effective surveillance tool. Mafia turncoat Big Ron Previty wears a wire for almost three years, recording the activities of the Philadelphia mob. Ron Previty brought evidence in against three separate Cosa Nostra family bosses. Uh, John Stanfa, who he was able to get close with, uh, Ralph Natale, who he got very close with, and Joe Merlino. Previty is the key to bringing Natale and Merlino to justice. He records 400 hours of conversations for the FBI, and many place Natale at the heart of a narcotics ring through Philadelphia and New Jersey. The evidence is overwhelming. The FBI finally makes its move against the beleaguered boss. In 2000, Natale pleads guilty to eight murders, several attempted murders, extortion, illegal gambling, loan sharking, and drug distribution. In a bid to save his own skin, Natale makes an extraordinary decision to cooperate with the feds. He is the first sitting boss in American mafia history to squeal on his mob associates. Natale realizes he's a two-time convicted drug dealer. This is life if it gets convicted. And Natale decides that's it. Uh, Previty's got me nailed already. I'm going to cooperate. Natale is living proof that the old mafia code of silence and respect is dead. His testimony finally nails Joey Merlino. In December 2001, Merlino was sentenced to 14 years in prison on charges of racketeering. Between Previty and Natale, their evidence helps convict over 20 ranking members of the Philadelphia Mafia and decimates their organization. On January 21st, 2005, at the age of 69, Natale is finally sentenced to 13 years in prison. After he's released, he'll spend the rest of his life in witness protection. The two men who helped the FBI bring down the Philly mob have broken the most sacred and time-honored codes of the Mafia. Such transgression brings with it the risk of imminent death. But so far, they're alive. Nick the Crow, Caramondi, was one of the first to sing. He now lives in an undisclosed location under an assumed name in the Witness Protection Program. You know, I'm lucky that I'm still here, let's put it that way. You gotta be safe, safety, <laughs> that's the word. I'm always looking over my shoulder to watch who I see, or, you know, try to stay low-key. 
Big Ron Previty remains in the Atlantic City area, refusing any protection from the federal government. I have to be careful. A lot of people don't like me, but then again, I don't like them either. So, case or out, or out, whatever it will be, will be, you know? When you're born, there's a date you're gonna die. And I lived a good life. I really did. What happened to the mob in Philadelphia can be seen happening all over North America. If there ever was a, a code of silence, and if there ever was uh, this idea of honor and loyalty that disappeared a generation or two ago, it was a phenomena, the Italian-American gangster experience, but I think it's pretty much played itself out. The mob no longer has the powerful support network of community, language, and culture that Angelo Bruno relied on. Traditions that once formed a protective cocoon around the mafia are now gone. Unable to withstand outside pressure from law enforcement and social change, the once powerful Philadelphia mafia family collapsed, never to recover.